50 minutes, take a break for 10 minutes, 50 minutes. Sound good? Um, at this point, I only know with any certainty that three people have unlocked the course. How do I know this? Huh? Well, one, I can see it, but that would involve me looking. Pardon? Email me with what? The pictures of what? Yeah. Could be people looking at me like, what the fuck is he talking about? <laughs> so, given that you are now all third year students and like, you know, graduating in less than a year, you have 22 weeks left in university technically. for the cameras, for the recording, stop fucking around and do everything now. Because you ain't got time. You genuinely ain't got time anymore, okay? First thing you have to do after the session today is read the module handbook, because then you will know what topics you are covering. Until you know what topics you are covering, you won't know how to do the assessment, which is due in seven weeks. Which now counts for a lot, right? Because it's third year now and everything counts for loads and everyone's under a lot of pressure. And in this year you're going to age greatly and you're going to get peptic ulcers and it's going to be a whole bunch of fun and I'm not here to help you, I'm just here to tell you. Okay. No, I am here to help you. Uh, please, um, module handbook is right here, right? Read it now today. I know some, thank you to those who have. Connor, I, like, you've got to read more closely, dude. Right there. <laughs> okay. But you at least have read it through to the end. Uh, I just wanted to very quickly go over some of the stuff on Canvas for you. As if you've done a module with me previously, you will know that I try to give as much reading as possible outside of the library because the library is not great for reading materials. So pretty much everything that you would need to do well on this module, as you can see, that reading folder is quite minimally large. You won't need to read all of it, but you know, use what you need to. There is no need for you to essentially use the library. <coughs> if there's anything you want me to get that you want me to put in that folder, if you see something and you think that might be useful, can you please get hold of a copy of it? Email me, I will get it for you and put it in there for everyone else as well. Um, is there anything else which is really handy? All of these things here, I suggest you all sign up for this uh, newsletter, which comes out once weekly from The Guardian. It's really handy. 
in terms of picking out key themes of games which are coming out right now. Um, I'm sure they're going to be having a shit fit about, uh, what's it called, it's not called FIFA anymore, it's like EA 24 or some shit. I'm sure that's what they're going to be writing about for the next while. There's a bunch of stuff here which is interesting. This um, here relates to um, the first assignment. Here are example channels of the stuff that I want you to put together for the first assignment. Uh, and a whole bunch of academic reading on next plays. But on the first assignment, there is uh, put together a playlist of all of them from last year. So just like we, if you've done social media with me, you'll find everyone that we've done last year in there. Last year was the first year of this module, and it went really, really well in terms of achievements. There were 14 students enrolled, 12 of them got first. That's good. That's pretty good. But it, it's not like I'm handing them out like confetti, I'll be honest with that. Some of them were just like, whoa, my God. I, like, I couldn't do this as well. I honestly got about four videos there. I was like, I could never do that as well as that. So it, it, I was really, really. I gave somebody an 80 for one of the videos, which I don't, I don't give 80s. I think 80s are obscene. I think there's some, they should come with a health warning. That's just somebody getting very overexcited usually. But I was like, oh, that's really good. So, um, as you'll see if you've had a look at Canvas on the weeks to weeks, the module handbook is huge in itself in terms of the reading lists I've given in there. But the key reading for week to week is only like two. And they're usually from those books, which Jay, do you want to hold them up for me? Those are the two key books. They're both in the reading folder, if you prefer to read electronically. Jay's obviously taken them out of the library. Um, week on week, you'll see a lot of this as well. Please don't get too intimidated that you have to read everything that I put on the week to week. That's not what it's there for. Right? I've put things which I've seen which I think would be useful, which you might want to dip into for references and so on, you can just click here and it will take you to those pages. But some of them are like, which one is this? Okay, things about who gamers are. There's a lot here, for example. There's one further down on gender and gaming, I think, which is just absolutely insane in terms of them. But then that's a very popular area. And as you can see, the references are bang up to date for this year. So if you want to further your reading in that way, then that's how to do it. Do you have any questions so far? No? It's not good. Well, let's begin. Oh, shit, I'm not doing it that way. Bye. <laughs> if you have it, can you all log in, uh, can you all pull up Neopod? If you don't, download the app. Or put it on the app. I forgot that. You can tell I haven't done this in five months.
Are we all in? Abby, do you want me to read it out for you? Put fucking glasses on. What's the matter with people who wear glasses and don't wear them? They're not on, they're on the top of your head. That's not how you wear, they meant to go over your eyes. When you do your laptop's not working. Your laptop's not working. Yes. You know the button that says on? <laughs> Press it. You know. It is the first day. This is the first thing, right? Yeah. Oh, man. Is it frightening? Yeah. No. Are you all, all alright? Are you all stressed out? A little bit. A little bit? Quite a bit. What's the matter? Come on, let's chair, let's talk. Let's get all these nerves out of the way. What's the matter? Me? Yeah! No, I'm good. I'm good. You just said you were alright, you weren't alright. No, I'm probably probably worse people mentally than me. You reckon? Maybe. I don't know, man. Really? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Is it Alright, okay. You all know how the food is gonna work, right? Do you know you've got no stamina? Yeah, sounds like it. Don't have to waste time with that shit no more. Um, has anyone got any real concerns about their third year of study before we begin? Before I even start doing anything? No? Okay, now listen to this. All of you have got this far because you have done well enough to progress this far. You are all going to be fine. Third year will go swimmingly. It will be busy. And you will find it pressured and you will at times feel under a great amount of stress. What do you do when you feel under a great amount of stress? Do not say hit the fucking vodka. <laughs> That's how I deal with stress. This is not how normal people should. What do you do? Crack on. <laughs> in these times of enlightenment about mental health, that is not the way that we deal with stress. Crack on. <laughs> but this is how Jay deals with stress, and let's all take a lesson from Jay. No. Who do you approach when you think you are not able to cope? First instance. You. Do you really think I'm going to help? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, okay. So one, they're not called academic mentors anymore because in the wisdom of the university, that's quite alienating, apparently. We're not called personal tutors again. Okay. Yeah, which is a whole thing and I'm not into it. Um, but nevertheless, it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, in the first instance, if you are feeling massively stressed, talk to your academic mentor about being stressed and they can signpost you to help if you need it. Huh. Secondly, talk to the person who is the coordinator for the module that you are finding difficulties with. That is really, really important in year three. They are not empowered to give you extensions, albeit they might well suggest that that's what you need, but they will also literally be able to help you with the content in which you might be struggling with as well. It becomes much more important in year three this. If you are doing a dissertation, do completely the opposite of what I've just said. Don't talk to the person who is running the module. Talk to the person you've been allocated to, which you don't know yet if you're doing a dissertation, you won't got that far yet, but you will be allocated to a supervisor. Talk to them, okay? They are there to help you with that. Most important thing in year three is if you feel at any point that you need assistance with it, you ask, because it is fast paced and there is a, because of the, the reason why there are a lot of crunch points is really straightforward in year three. We have to get your marks processed at particular times, which is way before year one and year two, usually get their marks processed, because you have to graduate on a particular date. In order for that graduation to be done on that date, it needs the, all the marks need to be processed about two months before the graduation date. Your graduation date is roughly going to be 27th of July. I can't confirm that for certain, but it's probably going to be that date. In order for you to graduate, all your marks and so on from both semesters have to be done by the 27th of May. That means all of your assignments are bunched and they are early. There's nothing that can be done about it. Until the university decides to get rid of all the crap that they've got, that's how it's going to work. So, 
it is pressured because of that. As soon as you feel even the slightest bit of pressure, you talk to either your academic mentor or the person in charge of that module, okay? And lean on them. If you are not confident with talking people face to face, you email them, okay? Don't let it go. Don't let one thing go this year, okay? It's too important. All right? Good. Okay. Hands up. Who's studied video games before? Oh, I have. Go on, Emma. When? Really? Doing what? Okay. Okay, so a little bit. Yeah. Anyone else? Jane? Yeah, a little bit. Just like more family stuff, or like Tomb Raider and stuff like that. <laughs> Ooh, and what is the feminist critique of Tomb Raider? Um, it's a role model, <laughs> feminist role model. Like, and it obviously comes into colonization or is a lot. It's really problematic game to write. I mean, there's a really interesting uh, affirmation of female game characters in Tomb Raider. I mean, it's the first major video game of that kind where there was a female character to play. Then you look at the construction and representation of women in that character, and you think, oh, that's a bit problematic. How Lara Croft can stand upright. It's a bit of a mystery to me, because honest to God, that woman would have, if she was real, would have the worst back pain ever. Um, but in the same time, what does Lara Croft do in those games? She engages in a classical neo-colonialist escapade where she subjects people who are of different colours and races to her to varying degrees of degradation and then robs all their stuff. It's a problematic video game in itself, yeah. But, um, so the good and bad. Most video games are like that. Most media attacks are like that. What we are going to do today is trace the history of, and maybe pick out where Lara Croft actually sits in this history of video games. Can anyone tell me when the first video game was invented? <laughs> you more specific? Is that a tennis game? Yeah. I can't remember what it was. <coughs> I think there was one before it, wasn't there? There was loads before it. Mm. <laughs> okay, but, but this is not bad. I don't know, sorry, this is Space Invaders, I don't know if that's right. Wasn't. Space Invaders comes after Pong. But, um, but no, these are all good estimations. Like made using a TV and like... Yeah, yeah. The, what's it called? The side of the TV and like... And then I might be making this up. You are? Yeah. But that's alright. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry about that. That's why I'm here to tell you about all these things. These aren't actually bad estimations. We um, naively think that video games start uh, kind of 70s, 80s. It's not that far away. It's not that far, really. But the history of video games is a history of what we call affordances. Each generation of video game technology allows us to do more things with the medium. And if we think of video games as a medium and related to the technology that we have, you have, uh, I'm going to ask a question in a second which will make this clearer, you have today a generation of games which would have been impossible 40 years ago. And because of that, the whole experience of video game play has been transformed by the technological improvements over time. At a root, what you do is exactly the same thing. If you want to be incredibly basic about games, you, as a player, use an input device to make changes to a digital interface, which is displayed to you in a particular way. None of that has changed. It's exactly the same thing that we do today, but the complexity of what we do when I was a kid, a video game controller was a little stick with a button. It's not anymore. It's a whole thing that I hold like this, and there's like 12 buttons on it, and it gets thrown across the room when I lose to some 10-year-old Malaysian kid at FIFA, which happens much too regularly. What the hell is wrong with these kids in these countries like Malaysia and Indonesia? Is that all they do is play FIFA? Oh, whooped! The other night, alright, like five, six, one. God, that was my best. Um, now, we will go through 
this today. And I'm going to frame it as um, through the lens of martial nuclear. Okay? So, for the last time, I hope, in your degree, can somebody please tell me what Marshall McLuhan said? The medium is the message. What does that mean, Will? It means that you cannot separate the form that a media comes in from the content within it when you're studying it. Super. So, in the context of video games, what that means is you cannot separate the content, the game itself, from the technology on which it runs. The technology on which it runs dictates the complexity and the level of experience that you will get from playing that game. That is not to say that games in the past weren't immersive or you didn't feel a sense of presence in them. You did. It was very strange that you did. I used to invent stories about things, for example, when I used to play Mega Drive as a kid, and I will get into that in a bit, but it's, it's not. It reveals a lot about my psychopathologies some of the stories that I did used to tell about these things. That is absolutely spot on. The history of video games is a history of technology which allows games to develop. And we are going to trace some of that today. So, first up, what have we played this summer? If somebody's got nothing to write to you, that means you're in the wrong room. Because like, it'd be like going to a film class with Joanna and saying, I don't watch films. And then Joanna goes mental. I write to I haven't even played two. I only just got a PS5. I don't want to spoil it. So I'm waiting for the remaster and then I'll play two. Okay. It's just, there's going to be already well, a remaster. The second one's out. It all came out like a, like a couple of years ago. Yeah, the second one's out, yeah. but they didn't remaster it for PS5. They just like. And they're going to do that. I think so. <laughs> so I, I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to wait. I don't know the story. I mean, I will it. get into this in one. I I at some point in the module as well about this is really bad. <laughs> Connor, it's finally got to the party. You know, so it's only been out seven years, but yeah, you finally yeah, got there, yeah? It's, it's too good. <laughs> it is too good. Okay, what we got here. Um, you know, in video game parlance, we, and I'll get into this in like week nine of the lectures or something like that. Game designers and companies say that there are two types of gamers. There are player one and player two. Player one is me. And you, Adam. And well, And you. And you. And all of you sitting up there. And Jen. And what have we got in common? Which is... <laughs> you are right. Well, what gender are we? That's spot on, yeah. We are male. We are male, and not only are we male, we are also white. And we are, relatively speaking, in a global sense, affluent. Player one is a white male from an affluent background who plays a particular type of game, like the Halo games, like Apex Legends, like CSGO, <laughs> like The Last of Us, like League of Legends, like Red Dead Redemption 2, like yeah, Baldur's Gate 3, like yeah, MK1, which I see in a few places here. Uh, what we got? This is interesting. Dead Space Remake would be one. Call of Duty would definitely be one. Battlefield would definitely be one. These are games which are made for us. If you play them, Emily, bonus, but they're not for you. Screw you guys. You are player two. Women, broadly speaking, are player two. The mobile game industry. You know, shit like, I don't know, it's that crappy game with the fucking colours. Um, Candy Crush and stuff like that. Yeah, they go and Arby's like, oh yeah, I love that. <laughs> 
perfect example. Uh, Minecraft. Player 2. A hugely successful game, to be fair, but uh, not meant uh, specifically for the market which AAA games are for. AAA games, those games which cost hundreds of millions of dollars to develop. Does anyone know what the development cost of Red Dead Redemption 2 was? Just before before it even came out, how much money they spent? How much? A million. Two million? No, 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 way more than that. <laughs> it's well I don't know how much specifically, but I'm guessing around 200 to 250 million. It's more. $400 million spent before a game was released. Do you know how much you made in the first five days? I guess it was about 1.2 billion. It's the biggest entertainment release of all time. So it's the biggest grossing entertainment product of all time. That is Grand Theft Auto V, which thanks to its online uh, game has now made more than 12 or 13, well, they reckon somewhere between 12 and 13 billion. It's hard to actually quantify just how much it's made. By contrast, the biggest film ever to come out of Hollywood is about 1.8 billion. So it's made more than 10 times the biggest film in history. Um, so we're talking huge numbers here in terms of those AAA games. Those games are marketed largely towards men. This is a significant problem in video game culture because is it just men that play video games? No, it certainly isn't. Just look at the composition of this room. Although this is weirdly the most gender equal room I have ever sat in for a media studies class. Because um, they usually dominate by women. Because there's more women in the studies than men. This is quite strange. And last year it was only like, it was exactly the same as the other, so I don't know what's going on here. Games like The Sims um, also would fall into that sort of player two category. And very often they can be defined by the kind of objectives that you are asked to do. So, Lucy, I don't know if you thought you were going to be quiet all the way through this. Lucy over here is not doing this module. She's just a sadist or masochist, depending on your perspective, who wants to come in and watch these lectures. Luce, tell the good people what you are doing a master's on. Um, so I'm doing a master's on children's game play, specifically focusing on the differences between girls and boys' gender, with um, kind of a hair laying on the side of the girls' game movement and how all these games are like actually completely rubbish for women and girls in comparison to men, of course. Give them an example of a completely rubbish girls game. Oh, Bratz. 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 Girls, best game in the world. Has anyone played any of the Bratz games? I recommend you do. As a video game that is made for female players, it's remarkable. In that, it's so bad, so stupid, and so it lacks complexity, it lacks internal rationale, it lacks any kind of interest. And then you look at it and think, okay, you've designed this game for a particular market. What does that say about what you think about this market? It's like, whoa, you hate women. You don't just dislike them, you hate women at this point. Really interesting. So Lucy's research is really interesting. As a side note, if any of you want tips on how to get a first class degree in media studies, ask Lucy. Because she knows. Because she's done it. But she's very modest and she wants to walk around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so if you see randoms pitch up, it's just, it isn't just like randoms. Who, I mean, because Lucy do look like you're going to shoot the place up, but it's not. Um, but it's not, she isn't. It's just how Lucy dresses. Um, <laughs> So, have we got any questions so far? Um, I, uh, there's a couple of interesting trends here that we need to pick up on, right? MK1, we don't know what we're referring to here, Mortal Kombat 1, right? Does anyone know why it's called Mortal Kombat 1? This is the 12th game in the series, but why is it called 1? They did like a... They did a story reboot. Yeah. The story reboot right from the beginning, right? You know, um, from the very first instance of the game. Does anyone know when Mortal Kombat came out? 
first game. No? I thought any of you were born, obviously. In 92. Yeah. And I was, uh, I was young. I had hopes and aspirations and I wasn't crushed by life when Mortal Kombat came out. Um, why would you reboot a 30 year old video game? What's the point? The law and the people going into the game have no idea what's going on. So you start the new game and you'll be like, why is this character trying to kill this character? But you can just reboot it and you'll be like, oh, oh, that's a really it. interesting way of putting it. Everyone knows who Sub Zero was, you know, kind of who Scorpion and Sub Zero are. You don't really know why they're fighting each other. So if you, you don't know why they hate each other. Yeah, it's like watching like, a film halfway into the series before watching any of the others. You just have no idea what's going on. It's a it's a really, really good point, Aiden, and it's it's probably more than I would give credit for. But I think it's a well made point. And I always look for the motivation in that. So yeah, I think what Aiden's just said is absolutely spot on. But why would so there's a further question because you know you know what I'm like right now is like, okay, so why are they doing that? Money. Yeah, of course, yeah. Because this will attract another generation of players into that game narrative space that they've created in Mortal Kombat. Because in fairness, people won't know those questions. Who is, has anyone in here played the original Mortal Kombat apart from me? And you probably would find it incredibly difficult to play as well. It's not a very easy game now to play. Um, it wouldn't map on well to current consoles and it wouldn't map on well to current control systems, I can assure you. It, it was difficult in the 90s to play that game. You <coughs> create, you recreate the game in order to create a new market for it. What's increasingly happening here, we've got another example here with the Dead Space remake. Dead Space is only, I say only, but it's like 15 years old. And they've rebooted, not rebooted, they've literally remade the game for current generation consoles. We see this happening a lot now. One of the biggest games this year was um, Resident Evil 4, which is, I mean, they haven't added anything to that game. They've improved the graphics, they've improved the controls, which in itself has improved on the original game, which was good in the first instance. But they, is it a new thing? No. We're getting to the point in video game cycles of development where video games are getting a lot like Hollywood. Hollywood's had this problem for a number of years now. What do you get out of Hollywood? You get superhero movies and you get remakes. And we're starting to get this kind of thing in video games now where you get in major franchises, superhero movies, major franchises, like FIFA or EA as it is now, which get continual releases year on year, and then a bunch of remade properties or sequels to things which have already come out tells us that the creativity in the industry is starting to be subsumed by the need to make money. You look at things which have been successful in the past. The interesting one with Dead Space is it wasn't necessarily that successful in the past. It was really critically acclaimed, but it didn't sell a huge amount. <coughs> but they've noticed, okay, well, here's a market. We can get people to sell it. This also relates to the profile of who actually plays games now. In the past, it was often thought that video gamers were young. That's no longer the case. People are playing far longer in their lives now. So you reinvent the past of people. So I guarantee there's a bunch of people my age buying MK1. Because you get that warm glow of nostalgia that, yeah, I used to rip someone's spinal cord out in this game in the 90s. And I'm going to keep on ripping spinal cords out today because now I've got like a wife and a kid job and mortgage and I really need to rip a spinal cord out at this point but you don't want to do it to like your boss or your kid or whatever so you know you can do it this way um, I'm glad everyone plays what you might want to think about at this stage is I'll get to this in a second but assignment one is going to be a let's play of a game that you have played Last year, a couple of people took the approach of we're going to play, I'm going to play the Lex of a game they'd never played before. It worked really well in one instance because the video was really sarcastic. Because um, Eve did play um, Red Dead Redemption 2, right? 
because she was sick and tired of her boyfriend playing it like 20 hours a day. So she decided to play it. She wasn't very good at it. Her video's really funny because she doesn't know what the fuck she's doing. And it's very, very funny. And she just disses all of the major features of the game, which is supposed to, yeah, so this is supposed to make the game really immersive, but I just think it's shit. I don't care if he's got a knife. <laughs> And it's in this like flat tone all the way through. It's like, I don't care if, he, if his hair grows. I don't care if he needs a shave. I don't care about any of this. It was really good. The other one, somebody who played a really old game, uh, The Oregon Trail, didn't work quite as well because they, I think they wanted it to be better than it was. They just thinking like, oh, this is going to be amazing. This is a game that's classic. And they played this like, yeah, but dude, it's like 40 years old. It's not going to be that good. Like, you know, it's like, Breakdown of the module. This is in the module handbook. As you'll see, there's reading for each week. We don't have a seminar, but the reading for each week will give you the context of what's going to be in the lecture. So it is important you at least engage with that reading. I would say I've cut the module into two sections. Weeks two, three, four, five, and seven are relevant to assignment one. The weeks after that are relevant to assignment two. Okay? I've tried to do that as best as possible. You might well want to use some of the content from the weeks at the end in the Let's Play videos, and that's fine. You can access that material, you can access the reading, etc. So you can access the videos from last year with the lectures if you wish to do that. But roughly speaking, what I would expect you to cover in the video is, in, is bunched at the top. That's why I actually, if I was doing this logically, I wouldn't do it in this order. I would bring some of these earlier. I'd actually certainly bring eight and nine earlier in the course, but I think it works better for the assignments this way. Sadly, I mean, there's loads of stuff here that I can't cover in this module, unfortunately. Video game studies is a very large field. We've only got 10 weeks. In particular, week 11, which is the one which people are least likely to come to, is probably very important for what you're going to do in assignment two as well. So do keep that in mind. If you're not going to be around for that, make sure you can cover it at least. The key texts. Jay, do your work again. These are the two I recommend. All right, if, if in particular, <coughs> This book here is called Understanding Video Games. There is a copy of it in the reading folder. It doesn't have great detail, but it has great depth. Okay, it, it covers everything in the whole field. So that's really, really useful. This book is really interested in that they pick apart things and go into them into a great amount of depth. There are other very, very useful things which are in the module handbook, which I will, you know, I obviously, week on week reading is there as well. I don't think there's anything that I recommend you read that isn't in the, the folder, or you can't find by searching for it online. So there's nothing locked out in this course. You should be able to find everything. Okay, let's do the assessments. How many of you did social media with me? Okay. You can put your hand up too. Did anyone watch the um, Minecraft video, the social media one? Yeah? She done it. <laughs> uh, so, I'll still use it. It's pretty good. Assessment one, gaming analysis project, that's what I call it. In essence, we can break this down. You're doing a let's play video of a game that you like to play. So in the language that I have to put in the handbook and in the module descriptor, critical analysis of a chosen video game and critical reflection of your own play of that game. This has to be you playing it. But, <laughs> cheat number one. I know of at least one person last year who didn't play that game. Or they did play it and couldn't get recording off their PS4 to work properly. So they used a lot of content that they found on YouTube and repurposed it. One thing I don't want you to get hung up on here is the technical aspects of actually recording the game itself. 
It's not doesn't have to be super professional job of the recording of the game. And if you have a lot of points to make about a game that you have, but you think, right, I'm struggling to put the content together here, look for some content online so you can help you build those points. It's not there's no way that I could know it was you or not anyway. Okay? So but I would much prefer it to be you, but if worse came to worst I would much rather you submit something which makes all your points, and I don't know whether you play the game, but I would vastly prefer to do it was you. You have to make a video for this. This, you know, this is a visual medium. There is no such thing as a journalistic piece which illustrates video games. It's not how it works. So it has to be a recorded thing. Is there anyone in this room who doesn't own a console or a PC? How are you going to do this? I don't know. I, I, thought, uh, <laughs> I thought you were going to give me a solution for that. Da, 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 da. I am. I will lend you either a switch or you can use the room uh, in James Callahan and use the PS5s or Xboxes or whatever you need to use. Okay. okay. Thank you. So if, if you are struggling for equipment, I've got you covered, but you need to let me know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Look, there's a load of games available. It's up to you what you want to do with them. Think of it as a critical walkthrough. Uh, it'd be good to look at some of the examples from last year in order to get your head around what that means. Critical walkthrough is you are telling me what you are doing and you are using critical material in order to explain that to me. So. If you are playing Red Dead Redemption 2, for example, is a really easy one to do on this. And, you know, what do we do in Red Dead Redemption 2, Connor? Uh, there's a lot. Uh, Such as? I mean, you've got the, you've got the main story. Sure. There's like loads of like, side quests you can do. So, uh, I, I don't know, we'll pick something from the main story, right? I have got to uh, rob the bank. Play that mission? Yeah. Yeah. What does that tell us? How can we critically analyze that robbing of the bank? Well, one, it's using narratology tropes of gangsters from Hollywood. You know, uh, traditionally gangsters have been portrayed as people who rob banks, basically, right? So it's playing off a critical trope of that. And you have all sorts of cutaways in order to frame it in that way as well, even though it's a, it's a, and it's a classic Western trope. What is the purpose of that? It is to situate the game's activity and action within a particular setting that we recognize as being authentic. When we think of, you know, what was the old West like? Yeah, it was people who were going around robbing and shooting one another. It actually wasn't. The old West wasn't like that at all. It was mostly people dying of dysentery. But we don't want to put that in a video game, although, and trust me, the Oregon Trail puts that in video games. But, um, Instead, we want to say, right, this is much more glamorous than that. It's all robbers and stuff like that, getting money and stuff. It's not people struggling with typhoid epidemics. Because that was much more like what the old West was like. So, do you see how I've just done the critical thing of that? You do get tuberculosis in the game. You do get tuberculosis in the game, that is true, yeah. Um, which is pretty sanitized. Yeah, you cough yourself to death. You do cough yourself to death, but it doesn't cough much during it. He would have been hocking up blood all over the place and like making other people ill as well through that time, you know. So it is, but it's, it's a nice touch, definitely. It gives a nice touch to the idea of death in video games as well, which is kind of interesting because, spoiler alert if you haven't played Red Dead Redemption 2, but um, the main guy dies. Um, <laughs> uh, in. Uh, what, can you, what else can you do about Red Dead Redemption 2? You could talk about obviously violence in video games. Racism. Racism. It's a huge topic, isn't it? Yeah. Women's rights. Women's rights, indeed. But also, if you're talking about your own play, what I would like you to focus on is the controls. Now, you don't notice the controls anymore. How long have you been playing it for? Since you know. So, uh, 2017, so we're talking nearly six years, right? You don't know. What, what platform do you use? Xbox. Xbox. Controller, you never look at it, do you? No. That's weird, isn't it? Xbox controller is a really meaty piece of thing. Does it feel heavy? It's funny that, isn't it? 
funny that controllers, when you get good at the game, when it becomes automatic, they stop. They don't weigh anything. When you're not very good at the game, and you just start playing it, you notice that they actually weigh quite a bit. That's strange, isn't it? You can talk about how you become accustomed to the interface in itself. Because the more you become accustomed to it, the more the game becomes embodied. And we have an embodied presence in games. We sometimes think of this as like the avatar that we play through. But our embodied presence in games is also how we actually control games. And as you get mastery of a game, your sense of embodiment changes radically. I'm playing Alan Wake at the moment, the original one. And the controls are not very good in that game. It's really awkward. But not anymore. I don't think they're awkward anymore. Because I've kind of got good at it now, and I don't keep on getting killed by these weird sort of cloud things at this point. I'm getting really handy with the controls. It's taken me a while to learn those things. My hands have had to learn how to do the game. Because the controls are slightly different to the games I usually play. That was tough at first. It's not tough now. Now, all of a sudden, when I pick up the controller, my fingers rest in the Alan Wake position. And when I buy uh, Spider-Man 2 at the end of the, this month now, I'm going to have to relearn my fingers how to play Spider-Man. I played the original game loads, and now I'm going to have to go back to it. So I played loads of games in the meantime, and they've messed my fingers up. And then I'll have to get back to the Spider-Man fingers. And then I will hold them ready for Spider-Man after that, until I get to the next game, and I'll have to relearn how to do that. This is what we call embodiment. That is something that people touched on last year. How their sense of control of the avatar becomes seamless. And how they have a genuine sense of being um, you know, Nathan Drake or whatever. Because you feel it in that way. So that's what I mean by play practices. How do you play? Now, in something like Red Dead Redemption 2, I don't know about you, Connor, but one of my favourite things to do with Red Dead Redemption 2 is to stand on the back of a train and lasso somebody <laughs> passing by and then fly them like a kite <laughs> and then let the lasso go and watch them die. That's awesome. Is like I gave up, I actually went back and replayed and finished, finally finished Grand Theft Auto 4 this summer. 15 years after it came out. I had to, I kind of stopped in the end because it got boring, but the reason it got boring when I originally played it was because I'd stopped doing the missions when I got a penthouse in Manhattan and just spent all my time on the balcony of the penthouse shooting prostitutes with a high-powered sniper rifle. I don't wanna, I'm not doing this assignment, right? But I would want to get into my gameplay choices somewhat, and my murdering of hundreds of prostitutes in the greater New York area would be something worthwhile to talk about, because it reveals some of my pathology, perhaps, at the time. Very important at the time. That was 15 years ago, and I've, I've matured as an individual since then. Right? Although I was, like, 28 or something. But... Um, those kind of choices are the things I'm going to do. So if you want to do something on Minecraft, wonderful. Minecraft's a great game. Tell me why you do the things that you do in Minecraft. That's an important part of this. And there will be material for you to pull those choices apart. Pick something that you play. It's my advice. But if it's you know, if you do something new, pick something that you actually want to play. That's important too. Project should be 12 to 15 minutes long. It's a slightly longer project because it's the third year, right? So you do have a little a bit more time to play with. Uh, I would say 15 minutes is absolutely ideal. Don't go over that. Okay. So um, I did have one really long video last year that's about knocking on 30 minutes, something like that, which is a bit ostentatious. I didn't mark anyone down and nobody said anything. So it's not, you know, 15 minutes is the guideline. If it goes over, I'm not, I'm not that concerned to be honest. Is it supposed to be like a straight up, like, let's play, like, you follow it, or do you edit it? So it's you can edit it as much as you want. It, within that, that's a really good point, Aiden, but within that context, it doesn't have to be a single shot of a game. If you want to jump around things, if you want to construct it, like, I'm going to say, right, I'm going to say four things in this video, 
and I'm going to give myself about three to four minutes each to say those. If you just do four different sections of the same game and stitch them, that's fine. As far as I'm concerned, that, and that worked really well for people last year doing it like that. A couple of people did singular ones. Somebody did it with a Call of Duty game last year. They just did a single shot through. It, it worked great, yeah. But I think it's easier to cover as many things as you want in that. That's a very good point as well. How many sort of critical discussions would I expect you to have in this? Three to four. I think that's ideal in this. You know, can you pick out three to four different critical sort of junctures to talk about? Assignment two is a two and a half thousand word critical essay. So it is an essay, but and obviously it is critical because this is a university degree you're doing. But it is a review. It is a review of the game of your choice. The only stipulation I make is you can't do the same game as you did for the video. You have to do a separate game. You can do a series if you wish, but I think it's easier to talk about one game rather than do a series of games. Did you do like Halo 2 for, I think that's no, and then Halo No, I'm going, to be, I'm going to be solid on that one as well. It has to be a different series of games for the video and the, the thing. I, it's a fair point, but um, I think in order to meet the, the criteria for a third year module, you'd have to do something different. Then there would be a different genre. You know, it, you know, you could do Halo, you could do another FPS if you wanted to. Um, it's a reflective exercise, but it needs to be written in a formal academic style. Basically, I'm, I'm trying to pick at the moment which ones to put up. Okay, which, which ones would be useful. Um, there were some really, really good ones done last year. So, again, it can be done really well. If you like, the classic example of this would be Grand Theft Auto V. Okay? Uh, biggest grossing video game, um, or video game product of them all, although Minecraft, technically speaking, is a bigger grossing game. Uh, what's wrong with Grand Theft Auto V? And it's not necessarily what's wrong with it as well. Criticism can be positive, but you know, what does Grand Theft Auto V say about the role of women in video games? Strippers and prostitutes? Yeah, to be murdered. You know, if you look, it, I don't know if anyone's played through the game in particular, but if you look at some of the NPCs in that game, especially um, Michael's family, his wife, sleeps around and his daughter is trying to be a porn star. Now, this is supposed to be satirical, but it's not really satirical when you look at the context, the wider context of how rock star games have portrayed women in the past in games as well, because they do this all the fucking time. It's like, it would be satirical if this was a new point, <coughs> but they've always portrayed women like this. And a company in which all the executives are men all the design leads are men, and most of the people working for the company is men, sees women as sexual objects to be used. That's a point of criticism about Grand Theft Auto V. It's interesting that Grand Theft Auto VI, they're going to try and change this, or they think they are at least, by giving us a playable female character. That only works if the playable female character is female. And what I mean by that is, if you look at something like... Um, Far Cry 6, which came out last year, you have a female protagonist in Far Cry 6, the first Far Cry game that had a female protagonist. What's the point? That female character did exactly the same things as the male characters before. But discernibly, there was no point of it being a female character at all. She was just a man doing female things. The weird thing about Lara Croft is, the only instances in which she is female as in a female thing, is that she's sexualized as a female. The character actually does nothing really female because really it's just a facsimile of the main character from Prince of Persia. It, you know, it, and they made it in 3D instead of 2D. But besides from that, it, it, and they sexualize the character as a female, that's it. It's like, people say, oh yeah, it's Street Fighter 2's got a female character. Um, it's hardly acting like a woman, you know flying up in the air and doing magic and shit and crushing people. You know, this is not really, you know, what we think of as women in society. It's not representation of women. So, I will put up some examples of this. I'll put up like three. 
Somebody last year in the social media module gave me negative feedback, bastards, but negative feedback for a very specific reason. I didn't give them marks for assignments that people had done when I was giving past assignments. My response to that would be, screw you, because I'm giving you lots of assignments to look at, so just be thankful anyway. But the more important point is, I can't give you the marks. There are two reasons for this. One, they are embargoed for three years by the university anyway, so three years from now I could be able to give you the marks, but who cares in three years' time anyway. Two, it is a GDPR issue. You will be able to identify that student potentially if you have that kind of information. It is too much information to give about a single person. So I'll give you a broad range of where this, where that essay lies. If you watch one of the essays in one of the videos, because they're named under the person's name, that makes this issue even worse, I can give you a range of what they were. But you can go away safe in the knowledge that of all those videos in the playlist for this first assignment, all but two of them got a first. So if you keep that in mind, you think, right, that's, that's, that's pretty good. I'm going to stop here and uh, five minutes, and then I will take you through the history of video games. Those dates are provisional, by the way. Okay, I don't know what the dates are yet. Those are the dates I've submitted to the exams office as dates. They could turn around and say, no, they're not. Because no, but normally you would have the first one like sometime in like then September or yeah. early September. Early September. Not early September. When I say mid September. Like it's October. Like, no. That's <laughs> <laughs> in November. September. Oh, I meant November. Sorry. Because it's it involves a bit of production and editing. I like to give long back. Yeah. So. Could it be about a car that you Do you want to give me more? As in, who are you talking about? <laughs> Do you two actually play games? I used to. Well, now you have a PlayStation 5, so <laughs> you just rub that in his face. We're going to have some gaming days in there. Yeah, great. No, what I think would be beneficial. Yeah, you can see, I, there was an essay nothing. last year about Mega Yeah, you're talking about nothing. Yeah, um, which I'll probably put up. And, uh, yeah. Um, there's some contextualization because we've got Mega Man 10. So the person who did it does talk about some of the other games in the scene. But focuses on 10. What I would recommend you do is use Princess Peach. Focus perhaps on one of the games in terms of driving the narrative of the essay. But you can contextualize it in all of the games if you wish to. But it might be. And almost you can rig that into. If the point you are, the overall point you're making is that female video game characters are constructed as being weak, needing male agency, etc., pick the game that illustrates that the best. Yeah. Because I had three, it's kind of hard now. Like I had, obviously I had my disciples with juxtaposition to you. Uh, I you need to cover this. This fucking gear. 
How Princess Peach defeats people with her emotions. She cries on them. That's, that's just wrong in all sorts. Yeah. 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 It works, definitely. In, in that sort of kind of, you know, looking at, um, I know, okay, I'm absolutely bending the assignment a little, but I wouldn't feel like sort of doing that because you are going to still focus on that game. Okay, like I said, um, these dates are only provisional. The reason being, they should be set by now. They haven't been. I understand why the assessment office is really, really overworked, unfortunately, which it doesn't excuse anything, but these are the dates I've submitted to the assessment office as being the turning dates for the assignments. They should be those dates, but they might change. Uh, there is a possibility they will change. Um, as you can see, I've also got the date wrong on the first one, which I just I'm not asking you to submit anything in 2022 because that would be impossible. And that to have a full year and a bit in between the two would be quite ostentatious even by my standards. Where are we at here? Okay, so let's get into the actual content. What is digital gaming? Digital games encompass both video games and computer games. This is an important point because being exact with terms here is important. And I am guilty of not being exact a lot of times. I will often use the term video games. Video games are a specific kind of digital game. Video games, we would usually think of as games played on a console, rather than digital games which are played via a actual computer. Historically, those two things were a long way apart. They're now much closer than they actually were. If you take open a PS5, you've got a seven, eight hundred pound PC basically sitting in that casing. So they are a lot closer than they were, but the interfaces are different, the way you play them is different, the context of playing them is different. So if we use the term digital games, we're encompassing all of these different types of games, which makes it easier. Talking about mobile games, console games, computer games, and other games played on any digital medium. And actually mobile games has become the really problematic thing over the last decade and a half. Because people really struggle to think, how, how is this a video game? It's not a video game. It's played on a small computational device. It doesn't fit with video game at all. And yet, the market for mobile games is absolutely colossal. So we did need to sort of change the terminology for this. As Will accurately said earlier about medium is the message from McLuhan, 
What we need to think about here is controllers, capabilities, interfaces, and cultures. The history of digital games is all about those things. <coughs> One of the things that people often overlook is controllers. In, there is nothing more important in a game than the controller. Because if you ain't got one, you ain't playing the game. It don't work like that. You have to have some interface with the game itself, or it's not a game. Something that you watch on a screen where you have no input to change what goes on on that screen is not a game. So you have to have some kind of input. Capabilities and interfaces. Capabilities in particular is really important in terms of the history about what you can do with a character. Historically, video games were very basic. Digital games in themselves, before even the digital came around, were very, very basic. That also relates to the interface itself, which if you think of the interface of something like Grand Theft Auto, uh, sorry, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, the interface allows you to do a lot of different things. Right? Switch weapons, look at a map, etc. So look at your health, look at what you've stored in your uh, inventory, etc. How are you going to mix things together, all these kind of things, right? That is an affordance of the interface that the game has. Interfaces previously did not have those kind of affordances at all. If you look at something like Space Invaders, it ain't got an interface. It's got a score, and that's it. There is no, You can't upgrade your ship. What are you talking about? You just move from one side to the other, blasting things, that's it. Cultures is what emerges from these changes. Video game culture has transformed incrementally as the technologies of video games have changed. For example, it's changed from a very niche hobby in the 70s and 80s, dominated by people who would actually not play at home but go to the arcade, <coughs> because that's where video games developed in those times, to becoming a home-based industry. Since 2003, four. Video game culture has transformed beyond belief. Can anyone tell me what happened then? 2003, 2004. Xbox, PlayStation. And you are, you are right, but what did they do which previous generations of machines didn't do? At home. Played at home. They were, we had that. Multiplayer. Which means? You can play against people everywhere. How? On, why, why? Online. Online. Online gaming and connecting uh, gaming consoles to the internet has transformed video game culture more than anything else. That is an affordance of the technology available to us. I think, why wasn't somebody doing that on Atari 2600? Well, guess what? You couldn't connect to the internet back then. You had, the only way you could do it was via phone. Um, you couldn't connect a console to the internet. So, the transformation of games into a genuine multiplayer experience with players all around the world has brought a new kind of gaming culture. A lot of people see that gaming culture as being very problematic, when we, certainly when we talk about gender in gaming, we will find instances of how that is the case. Let's have a little bit of history from you guys. What were the first things you played and on what? Original Xbox, the huge thing that you could beat somebody to death with. Oh, that was a massive. Win. People give people say that PlayStation Five is heavy. They never had one of that. Nintendo talks. <laughs> Simpsons hit and run. What a game. What a game. Crash Bandicoot 1 as well, what a game. Well, oh, my Switch. First, literally the first game I ever played. <laughs> Snake on the knocking. <laughs> <laughs> God. I'm a 
wasted so much time when I was an undergraduate student playing Snake on my phone. Uh, Super Mario Nintendo. A bit more specific on that. They've had them since like 1983. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I don't know how to be specific. I just remember I used to play that on my Nintendo. How old were you? I'm going to say 10. 10? I'm 10. Is that it's possible? Yeah, yeah. We, we're talking Wii or GameCube, I suppose. Yeah. Or DS. Yeah. Do you have a handheld one? or? A... I had the, one yeah, the first so one. So 2DS. Yeah. I'm going to have the 3DS. And the Minecraft on the iPad. Do you come from a, like a deprived area or something with Minecraft on the fucking iPad? I used to have um, Minecraft on my iPad too. <laughs> do you mean? Um, the Sims on people. Mm -hmm. Check Gemma with a P. Gemma's going to be one of these PC is gone people now. Um, games Channel on Sky. I remember that. They had that stupid darts game. That was really bad. Um, that also. I probably could have got a much better undergraduate. Um, okay, so you all come from a particular generation here, which I would expect, right? You're all roughly the same age as one another, so generation is some, like, a few people fall outside that because the original Xbox came out before you were born, Aiden. Uh, certainly the PS1 came out before you were born, uh, a long time before. Um, but roughly speaking, yeah, everyone falls into this. Your experience of video games is not just conditioned by the first things that you play, because obviously you will have played new things and uh, will approach things differently as you go through things. But a lot of the history of video games won't actually be that meaningful to you people in this room, because you have all experienced video games in quite a sophisticated manner. It didn't used to be this way. It did not. It wasn't anything like this way when I was a kid. So, the games that we start playing have a distinct effect on where we go. And it's really interesting here. Nobody, I mean, I'm going to roughly position this. But everybody in this room, their first game could have been Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. Why not? Why not something like that? And in fact, everyone's first game could have been Manhunt. Anyone know the game Manhunt? No? Anyone? Anyone ever played Manhunt? You played them. What do you have to do, Ab? Like, it's like you split up into two teams. Like, in person now, yeah? No, no, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I was <laughs> yeah. I played the one like, Anyway. So as we move away from Insanity Island for a minute, has anyone played the video game? You know the, the mod, Joe? <laughs> the video game man. Has anyone ever played it? Okay, it's great, all right? One of my favorite games of all time. You play a serial killer, okay? And you um, have to basically go around and bludgeon people to death in interesting ways to commit your crimes. What's even better was that they had a Wii version so you had to use the Wii controllers literally to bludgeon people to death with. Natural control system for murder. Great. I had a lot of fun. Um, but none of you played that first. What I'm interested in is why? Why not play an ultra-violent, sort of realistic <coughs> video game as your first experience of gaming? Nick? Is it because of the age restrictions? Does also, anyone give a shit about age restrictions? <laughs> Hmm? Okay. Parents. What, what is the cut off date where parents stop caring about age restrictions? Because at some point they just put up their hands and go, yes, you can play this game full of murder and crime and you know sexual degradation. Mine was my first Xbox because it just came with Assassin's Creed and I was like, that. Well, I'm just going to play that, yeah. Um, there is a certain cut off point. These games, by and large, if you look at things, especially Nintendo Dogs and stuff, and Mario Kart for an, to an extent as well. I mean, Adam, to be fair, Call of Duty 2, that's quite interesting. That was in like year five? <laughs> Something like that? <laughs> yeah. There is cancelling available, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, we've got anything else?
last year, which is really problematic. <laughs> Assassin's Creed, as well as you do say, Nick. Yeah. Um, there are a genre of games marketed to children, right? There are children's games which are important here. That in itself is an affordance of what the game technology today allows. Historically, games, although they might have been played by kids, they weren't made for kids when they first started up. Children weren't seen as being a market, perhaps, for video games in the way that they are now. But there are distinct generic um, sort of codes which mark out their children's games from this point. Okay. So, where do we start? 1948. The first discernible, what we might call at the time, video game, was developed in 1948. A cathode ray tube amusement device patent for an electronic game. Does anyone know what a cathode ray tube is? I wouldn't expect anyone to do so, but if you're interested in retro games, you might need one. There's a lot of consoles up to around 2000 don't play very well on HDMI televisions. They play on what we call CRT screens, cathode ray tubes. Basically, a cathode ray tube is how a television used to work before digital televisions came in. You have vacuum tubes which fire electrons at a piece of glass. That's how the display worked on televisions up until around the 2000s. Um, so, in 48, the first development of an electronic game which used television technology to power the game itself starts to come around. In 51, transistors start replacing vacuum tubes and students started to develop games themselves. Checkers and tic-tac-toe, classic, old, historic, traditional games. You know what I mean by checkers? Yeah, and like you play it on a chessboard, but it's not got the rules of chessboard and so on. And tic-tac-toe, noughts and crosses as we might call it. These become the first games that actually seem to work. The first game here in 1948, they could never get it to work. 48 is the first attempted development of a game. 51 is when we start to see games come along. But the first discernible, the reason why I don't count tic-tac-toe and checkers as digital games themselves is because they're really not. You don't need anything digital to play those games. You could you know, play tic-tac-toe with a piece of paper and a pen. <laughs> Checkers, you can get a board and some pieces and you play it, and it'd be infinitely better to do that than play on a historic sort of computer machine. The first discernible digital game which is different to other things that you could do emerges in 1961. It's called Space War, and I've put a link to it on Canvas. You can play Space War in your browser. You will get bored of Space War within... If anyone lasts a minute, I will be amazed. It's dull, boring, empty, and completely revolutionary and transformed the world as we know it as well. But these days it doesn't really have hold up very well. So the designer was a guy called uh, Steve Russell. The game was designed not as a game itself. It was designed as a way to test out some new hardware that they had in uh, Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology. So it wasn't set out, that, nobody set out to say, right, we are going to make an entirely new medium here. Instead, they wanted to design something that showed how quickly this new piece of hardware could manipulate graphics. Graphics at that time were in an extremely primitive phase, and computer interfaces were not graphical at that point either. Graphical interfaces for computers don't really become a thing until the 70s. But they had a machine which could power some rudimentary wireframe graphics, so they wanted to test it out. And they developed Space War. And that is about the best image of Space War that I could find. Because nothing happens. It's shit. It's a classic, but it's a shit. Classic. <laughs> The game actually became very widely distributed afterwards, once they found that it worked. There was a demand for this as a way of, of demonstrating what these machines could do. It's a bit like when the university says to me, Leighton, could you come in on an open day and like, do a VR demonstration? And I'm like, no. 
because open day is on Saturday and I don't work on Saturdays. And then nothing ever happens because nobody can do it. But my reticence to actually engage with the institution on weekends aside, it's the same kind of thing here. They have companies saying, oh, can we have a copy of Space War, please, because we want to show people and investors and students and what have you what these machines can do. Um, other games were developed by that lab, but there was no distribution network for them, so they never got distributed. So the MIT lab had a load of different games of this nature because there was no way of distributing them because literally in 1961, the internet didn't exist. It didn't exist until 69. And even then, it wasn't capable of distributing video games at that point either. Um, and there were no shops. There were no mailing lists. The storage for these was on punch cards rather than on any digital tape or anything like that. So there was no way, you know, going to just put like 2,000 punch cards, put them in a post, that's not going to happen. So games, there was no actual distribution network for them. So the start of digital games is singular computers having single games on them. No industry, no production, no distribution, no reviews, Nobody playing them at home, etc., etc. What do we have here? We have the basic idea. You can use a computer or a form of computer to run a game on. This is the first bit of testable proof that you can create something new and run it. Those computers had no digital parts either. It spins people out to think about this when you think about a computer. That was the size of a room, and it all revived, um, re relied on electrical circuits and pipes. It's mad to think about. If you ever go to a museum and see a computer from the 50s, you're like, what? That doesn't look like it looks like a radiator. Yeah, that's what computers look like. That. Things proceed throughout the 1960s in much the same way. The first commercial machine available is actually from 1971. It's called Galaxy Game, and it's a clone of the original Space War game. All that was done was to miniaturize the equipment by this point, 10 years on. The equipment becomes much smaller. Um, and this was developed in Stanford University, in the uh, computer labs in Stanford University, where basically they took choice, the experiment they were trying to do was run Space War on something as small as possible. And so they developed this small console uh, and then decided, as people do, is that right, we're going to make some money out of this. So they rigged up a rudimentary sort of coin slot in it and charged people 10 cents ago to have a go at Space War in the um, Student Union Bar at Stanford University. That sat there for 10 years and made that lab a shit ton of money. At one point, they, they were getting called out every day to empty the machine. It was, it was, people couldn't put any coins in it anymore because it was full. People loved this game. Drunk students love basic games, I think is the solution for this. And it ran until 1979. What do we call things like this? This image here, we have a particular terminology for them. Analog. <coughs> it is analog, but that's not, in the, in the context of Digital games, what is that type of game known as? <laughs> yeah, who said that? Good. Arcade game. If, has anyone in here played an arcade game? Yeah? Has anyone not ever played an arcade game? It's okay if you haven't. I just, like, I've got one. Down in the room down there. It's cool. Street Fighter 2, the arcade game. I've got the cabinet. Um, so if you haven't played one, don't worry. Okay. Around about the same time as the first arcade machine is being developed, we actually have the first home machine being developed. So this is a Magnavox Odyssey. This is the first home computing machine, or home games machine. Developed in 1967, first game was a chase game. You are a little object on the screen, and you chase after another little object on the screen. All the games are black with white graphics, because that is the simplest way to do things. 
You had a light gun, which you could shoot things with. Good luck for accuracy on that. It was pretty inaccurate. And you had paddles, which you could play things like tennis. Uh, there was no sound. No, that's not happening. There were no cutaways. There was no narrative. There was nothing. There was just a little blob where you usually have to try and get another little blob. And you, the controller had three dials on it. There was no stick or anything like that. Literally three dials. You spun... <laughs> You spun a dial upwards to go forward. You spun another one sideways to go the way that you wanted to go. So they hadn't really thought about interfaces very well at this point either. Um, when Bear made the Odyssey, uh, Magnafox bought the patent off him and bought the machine and sold, unbelievably, 100,000 units of this in the US. So by the end of the 1960s, there were 100,000 houses in the US that had a video games console in it. First system that actually brought games to television screens. Were they expensive at the they time? Were, for, well, if you adjust them for today, they were incredibly expensive. They were, they were, they were really expensive in the late 60s. It was about $110, $120 typically. Mm -hmm. Adjusted for inflation, that's a couple of grand. Yeah. You know, people moan about the PS5. Well, that you know, PS5 historically isn't very expensive. Weirdly, does it go for about 450 quid? Even if you adjust the PS3 for inflation, that's about 650 quid. So it, it, historically, it's not that expensive. In the arcades, Al Alcorn, what a name! Al Alcorn, that's just Al Al. I just love it. I just love that kind of name. He was Atari's first game engineer, and he designed the game Pong. That's the in actual initial game uh, Pong. So Aiden was talking about this earlier, right? It was one of the first games. Pong came along in 72. Um, the first demo machine, which there's an image here, which was in a pub called Andy Capps Tavern in Sunnydale, California. Um, the machine malfunctioned in that demo period because he got too full of points. Very quickly, Atari realised they were on a winner here. Again, I've put Pong up on um, Canvas. You can have a go at Pong. Okay, <coughs> browser. It's Ping Pong, right? Hence Pong. Um, it, it's shit, to be fair. It, if you get good at it, and you play it for long enough with two people who are both good at it, one point in Pong can go on for about 10 hours. You will be there doing it all day. Don't do this, okay? It's not worthwhile. One of the things which Atari didn't do is patent the game. So when people saw that Pong was a success, this is legitimately what happened, right? People from <coughs> computer labs around America would go and break into like bars and steal the Pong machine rip it open to see exactly how they got it to work and then make their own one and then start selling that and there was nothing that they could do about it because they never put a patent down on the machine. So very quickly you had the first video game piracy as well. Where, but it was, a, it was real piracy back then. You had to physically smash the game to pieces to see how they were doing. There was a litany of broken pong machines everywhere across America. And of course they were learning a lot of money, so people very quickly learned how to open up the coin bit with a crowbar as well to steal all the money out of it. This happened quite regularly in video games. In fact, I remember somebody doing that in the chippy down the road from where I lived in 1988 with a Pac-Man machine in there, going in there and emptying it with a crowbar. In the arcades, you start to see from the success of Pong, a development of different genres. So you have now a platform by which you can develop games which are commercially su successful. Pong was incredibly successful commercially. So you start to see new things come along. So the first combat game, 1974, simply called Tank. Guess what you had to do? Um, in 1973, Gotcha, the first pursuit game, the first driving game available commercially, where you like, have a look at it. Um, 
driving and racing game, I suppose racing is a bit different, there's Grand Track 10. Um, the first sit-down cabinet for a game, so the first game to think about an actual interface where you could mimic driving with a wheel. So a sort of natural interface comes in 1976. Um, in 1975, you get... Does anyone know the game Breakout? You play like a little paddle, oh, and then the ball, and yeah, 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 which is still kind of popular these days. I see loads of videos on TikTok that have got that as half of the sort of video. Death Race is, I leave that there because Death Race is the first game which the press picked up on as being morally problematic, because in Death Race you had to race after and kill the other racers, and they were like, oh my god, video games are so violent. This, is, this debate about video game violence has basically been around for nearly 50 years. As things go on, the biggest interjection in the 70s is this game, Space Invaders. As a piece of extracurricular activity, I put a link to a Space Invaders um, emulator on the thing. Have a go at it, and if you can get past the first screen, you win a prize next week. Okay. Just past the first screen. I bet you can't. I can do that. That's, that's, that's big talk. Uh, but talk is cheap. Uh, I want to see results. All right. uh, most people these days could not get past the first screen, it's fair. Really? The reason being is that it's really straightforward. This isn't, for me, this isn't a difficult game. Right? I've, I've been playing Space Invaders since I was an infant, basically. What does Space Invaders involve as a player? Concentration and reflexes. And by concentration, I don't just mean focus on the game. I mean serious concentration. You have got to be paying attention at a pixel by pixel level. Because when it gets fast, it gets real fast. You have to have control. You use it, if you had an arcade version, you're using a stick, which you can't just push it like that. You are tipping it like this. And then you're using the button as well at the same time. This kind of focus on the game and reflexes needed they don't exist anymore. Games these days don't have any of this. People go back and play these retro games and think, oh, this will be fun. And then they like, rage quit after like 10 seconds because it's really freaking hard to play those games now because we have no training in them whatsoever. All games used to be like this. No games are like this anymore. People think Dark Souls is really difficult. So, yeah? Yeah? Play Frogger. Fuck you with your difficult time. <laughs> um, so, Space Invaders, the reason why I have it here, 1978 Space Invaders came out, and it genuinely became a cultural commodity, Space Invaders. It became the first game where you had spin-offs. The first game where you have a paratextual relationship with games, where products were produced to promote the game itself. People had Space Invaders t-shirts. People had Space Invaders lunch boxes. People had Space Invaders yo-yos, etc., etc. A genuine industry came up about it. So popular that in Japan they ran out of 100 yen coins. Literally, they had to make more because they were all stuck in these machines. Um, so it created a currency crisis in Japan because there was there wasn't a certain amount of currency around that you could actually spend. Um, in 1979. You get Starfire, a terrible game, but brought something really important. The ability to put your name next to a high score. Classically, I don't know if anyone's ever done this, do you know how many characters you can use to put next to your name? Three. Three. <coughs> do you know what the most popular three character name, apart from AAA, is? ASS. -S. Yeah? That has always been the most popular, and indeed, that is the one I have down in the machine. Down in there. Um, what you see at this point as well is the development of the emergence of distinct companies who have a mark in the industry. Konami become very important in the late 70s. Namco become very important, <coughs> and most of those other ones get swallowed up by other companies. Uh, but what we are seeing here is development 
of games as an industry on basically the same kind of premise as the first games that were coming out. Anything else? What's that for you? Sorry about that. It's okay. Couldn't be more important, this game. 1980, Namco develop Pac-Man. Who's played Pac-Man? Uh, great. If you haven't played Pac-Man, go play Pac-Man. Very important. Original name of Pac-Man was Pac-Man. Can anyone tell me why they changed the name? Sounds like Pac-Man. Yeah, what would you do? If, let's say you're in an arcade, right? Mm. And this game is next to you called Pac-Man. I would scratch out part of the P instantly. That would be the first thing I'd do before even putting money in. In fact, I would use the coin to play the game to scratch out that bit of the P and then go play. So yeah, when it came to the US market, uh, they changed the name from Pac-Man to Pac-Man because they quickly realized this would be a marketing disaster. Uh, it became the best-selling arcade game uh, in history and developed the first identifiable character. Before that, I mean, you could argue, I mean, was it a character in Space Invaders? Well, not really, it was just a spaceship. You, you didn't really have a characterization. Is Pac-Man a character well, no, he's a yellow blob. It, it's difficult to say that this is a character, but this was actually played on. Pac-Man, this lovable little thing who gobbled up little dots and then got a big glowing dot and chased after the ghosts. Does anyone know the name of the ghosts? Holy shit, you're doing them a video game strip and you don't even know the name of the ghosts in Pac-Man. Come on, people. Inky, Blinky, Pinky, and Clyde. Don't ask me about the last one. I don't know why they called the last one Clyde, but Inky, Pinky, Blinky, and Clyde. Um, again, I've never worked out why that one was called Clyde. I don't know what was going on there. Um, this idea of characterization becomes incredibly important, as we know. In 1981, um, again, problems with video game piracy if anyone wants a context on this, and it's actually a program that you should all watch anyway, there's a documentary on Netflix called um, High School. It's a six part documentary on the history of video games. It's very, very good, and worth watching. In, I think it's episode one, they actually talked to the guys who did this, who decided to, to um, break open Pac Man and make their own version of it. And it ended up that Namco bought that version off them because. They decided to make a female character by putting a bow on Pac-Man and calling it Miss Pac-Man. The only thing important, I think, about Miss Pac-Man as a character is the Miss part, that they didn't make it Mrs. Pac-Man. I thought that was quite enlightened for the early 80s, and, you know, nuts. Um, so, at this point, we still <coughs> have arcade games as single-screen sort of entities. Very important company, who we all know and all love, then emerged in the early 80s in the arcade space. Nintendo as a company has been around for more than 100 years, but for most of its existence it was a trading card company. It's only in the early 80s that they start to emerge as a digital games company. Um, Donkey Kong becomes extremely important because it introduces the idea of platforms, that we have vertical and horizontal movement in games throughout. And in 1982, Donkey Kong Jr., the sequel to Donkey Kong, Mario is not in the original Donkey Kong game, but he does appear in Donkey Kong Jr., um, where <coughs> Donkey Kong Jr. throws barrels down at a rotund little Italian plumber who has to dodge them in order to find, once again, or for the first time, I suppose, the most useless video game character of all time, Princess Peach. That woman cannot go more than three minutes without getting kidnapped. So, by monkeys or dinosaurs or some shit, she is always getting kidnapped. Does say a lot about how video game designers see women as useless, sort of terrible characters. As that's going on in the arcades, we see some parallels going on in the home. In the home, so 1972, you get the first handheld game. A, um, a version of tic-tac-toe. 
Game cartridges start to emerge in 1976 as a way of actually distributing games. First joystick in 77, start to see vector graphics on screens. 1982, you start to see the emergence of the American industry and electronic arts in particular is born. The most evil of all video game companies, electronic arts. Do they think we don't see that they release exactly the same game every year for 60, 70 bucks and they never make any changes to it? Do they think, and we still buy it? Um, Commodore 64 becomes the first major in-house machine, uh, although some people would say it's a ZX Spectrum. You actually see the first instances of having network video games in 1983. Um, and you see the emergence of the consoles as well. So what I want to say there is that the home is behind the arcade. In 1983, you have the first video game crash. Atari, in the early 80s, became the biggest company in the world with regard to video games and the distribution of games in the house, in the home. In 1983, though, you had too many companies and too many very bad games. It was primed that some people were going to go down. 1983, you also saw a film released, directed by Steven Spielberg, called E.T., we all seen E.T. It was sad. It was terrible. I still don't like watching it. Um, E.T. came out in the late summer of 83 in the United States. And Atari wanted to get an E.T. game out for Christmas to be the big sell. So think about this. We're talking like end of August and they wanted the game out really for the start of December, a bit earlier even, to get it for the Christmas market. Gave the designers about 10 weeks to do it. In reality, they had about four weeks to do it, and they all got sorted. But they still had to do this. So the biggest video game of 1983 took four weeks to develop from beginning to end. Unsurprisingly, it was an unmitigated shit show of a game. I again have put a link for you to try and play this. I do use the word try in its correct form here. It is impossible to play this game. Um, it was released and reviewed and very quickly people came out with the opinion this is the worst stinking pile of crap that has ever been created. Atari were retailing this game at nearly $30 a, console, uh, a cartridge. They had printed out tens of millions of cartridges to sell under the assumption that everyone would want to take the cute little alien home for Christmas. Nobody took the cute little uh, alien home for Christmas. It bankrupted Atari completely. And all those games, they took the cartridges and buried them in the desert because there was no way to recycle them or anything like that. So literally, the liquidators of Atari dug a hole in the Mojave Desert and buried all the games in there. It is like the graveyard of Atari as a company. Several years later, a couple of academics went out into the desert, started digging and found the games. They're still, they were all still there. Nobody had touched them for like 40 years. Um, and they were still working, unbelievably. You could pick these buried games and sand out. Um, the great crash that so Monford and uh, Ian Bogus went out and found them. Um, the great crash is very important. Because it drew attention to the first time that video games were an industry of a scale of which, I mean, people lost their livelihoods, people lost their jobs. Shops, which had invested in Atari equipment, all of a sudden had stuff here. You know, people started to lose jobs in shops because shop had put money into it. Video game shops, which were a brand new thing in the early 80s, closed down. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with this. Those were second gen machines. Okay, so the first gen, and we have a generation classification system for um, home consoles, right? First gen, Odyssey, Colco, Bandai. Atari 2600 was the most important of the second gen. The third generation, we have Nintendo Entertainment System, Sega Master System, Commodore 64. Post crash, the Nintendo Entertainment System became the most important one in video games, without question. Through a really clever bit of marketing, where they said, 
they called it Nintendo Entertainment System and called it a home entertainment system. It didn't do anything to play games, but they cleverly marketed it towards being a home sort of entertainment system. Fourth generation is when I started playing video games, a very long time ago. Super Nintendo, Sega Mega Drive, Sega Mega CD. We see the emergence of CDs as opposed to cartridges here as a way of storing information. The fifth gen, Sega Saturn, Sony PlayStation, Nintendo 64. Extremely important generation, but can anyone tell me why? It's the step before. Home entertainment. Hmm? Home entertainment. All of these are home entertainment. Okay. This generation. We can say one. I was going to guess that these are the first like 3D. Yes. Yeah. That's the incredibly important point. This fifth generation introduces 3D graphics <laughs> to the home. Everything before then had been two-dimensional. 3D graphics coming in here. This is the point at which the arcade stops being the place of development for video games. And the home does instead, because the home can do what the arcade used to do. Sixth gen, we have the biggest selling console of all time, PlayStation 2, although the Switch has now overtaken it, but I think there's still different things. GameCube, Dreamcast, Xbox 360. A couple of important things happened here. That's the last Sega console. Sega had been incredibly important up to that point, but they disappear there because they've made so many shit decisions and done true. PlayStation 2, can anyone tell me why it's the biggest selling console in history? It did. It's it's a reason, but it's not the biggest reason. It's it's really really simple, but it never happened bef before this. DVD. Yeah, it was a DVD player. It meant people could make a decision, and I made this decision myself back in the day. Everyone was switching from. VHS videos to DVDs at that point. Now, do I want to buy a DVD player for like 100 quid? Or do I want to spend 200 quid on a PlayStation 2 that I can also use to watch this? No brainer. I will, you know, do the both. It became one of the biggest selling DVD players in the world as well. People would buy it just for that reason and that reason alone. No console before that could play any other home media. Um, now, we don't even think about it. You, know, you, you buy a PS5, you've got a Blu ray player as well, you just incorporate that into the system, right? So this generation had uh, PlayStation 2, which is the biggest selling. Seventh gen, which comes out, oh, actually that generation is quite short lived. Seventh gen, Xbox 360, PS3, and very importantly, the Nintendo Wii. And I know at the beginning some people said, you know, the Wii was the first console they played on. The Wii is incredibly important in that it changed the way that interfaces are thought of. Uh, for video games in the home. Prior to this, you do have some peripherals where you know you could buy a, say, a driving wheel for driving games or something like that, but the Wii actually built in that idea of haptic feedback into the controller in a way that had never been tried before. And also, the camera on top of the television became incredibly important there to map what you've got into it brought some actual technological advances in. 8th gen, PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Wii U and Switch. This is a remarkable generation for two reasons, I'd say. The Switch and the PS4. It's the fact that the PS4 is continue selling. It's really bottomed out now, the sales, but it might well get to the PS2 at some point. And the Switch is the biggest selling piece of equipment of all time. So what it tells us is that the market keeps on growing. There's no small nothing smaller here. We're now in the ninth gen, PS5, Xbox Series X, probably want to add Switch 2 next year, I would suspect, which will fit into that ninth gen. What we have is a continual story of evolution. The beginning of digital games, basic sprites on a screen where you have control over something. At each iteration, you build added layers of complexity. What do we have here that goes on? What separates, I don't know, the PlayStation 1 from the PlayStation 5? Well, processing, speed, memory. That's basically it. PlayStation 5 can do things that you would never believe back when the PlayStation 1 came out, maybe 30 years ago. But it's a technological change. 
is the technology has improved so it allows you to do more and more and more with the games itself. The storage mechanisms have changed. PlayStation 1 used CDs. CDs have got a space of about 667 megabits, something like that. Blu-ray disc on this, or, you know, we don't, and to be fair, 10th generation, we're going to be talking about no physical media whatsoever. Which means, in that 10th generation, there will be no game or shops like that ever again, because what are they going to sell? It's not going to, they're not going to exist at this point. So, each generation is an evolution on the last generation. There is nothing really revolutionary that happens here. Nothing that came out of the sky and was like, bang, it's going to change the world. You can trace the evolution of games back to that very first space war. Everything really was there in space war. It just needed the evolution of stuff to go forward. I'm going to skip over a couple of these because you can have a look at them in your own time. But I just want to get to this point to finish. When you think about the history of video games, the easiest way to, con to conceptualize it is evolution. And the evolution of technology, and this goes for any kind of medium, is that it's always built upon existing ideas. The people who design Microsoft's Xbox don't start with a fresh piece of paper. They look at the last generation and they ask themselves two questions. What works well and what didn't work very well? And the most important question is the second one, what didn't work very well? How can we improve that? And then you come up with the next iteration of the machine. And then you come up with the next. And they're already designing the PlayStation 6. They're already designing whatever Microsoft might call that next one, because they've got weird sort of naming criteria for it. The other thing that we take from evolution is the principle of the survival of the fittest. Technology succeeds when it fits the demands of the market out there. The reason why Sony win every generation, and they have done since they came into the market in 1994, is really, really simple. Sony's machines meet the needs of gamers better than any of the other machines. That's not to say Xboxes are bad, because they're not, they're really, really amazing. But the Sony machines fit the needs of a wider group of people much better than the Xbox machines do. And that's how they succeed and go forwards. Okay. Well, that was a really quick way of doing the history of video games. But there's loads more stuff on campus. Um, I will see you guys. I'll get this room changed, okay? And I'll let I'll send out an email to let you know which room we're in. Hopefully, be this one.